There is a bear at the side of the road. Bison alert, bison alert, we have bison. Rock Upper here, and welcome back to British Columbia. Join me as you travel through the northeast corner of BC on our way to the Yukon. We're on the BC Highway 2 and north. We're getting into moose country. Three days in a row of rain with no end in sight. That's BC weather for you. Storms roll in from the Pacific and dump their load. I left Alberta and was traveling across the remaining prairie lands, heading toward Dawson Creek and Fort St. John. But right now we just entered Poos Coo. Not sure how you say that. Turns out it's called Poos Coupe. I drove around this little town seeing if I spotted anything of interest. Canada Post. Gas is way more expensive here, $1.61 a liter. That's why I gassed up really good up in Alberta. Weed Mart. Definitely different than Walmart. It wasn't long before I found a museum and decided to have a look. There was no admission fee. And you can hang with these guys in the museum. And I'll give you a little quick tour. All sorts of good things here. Yeah. You can say hi to this guy, although he looks a little bit stiff, this RCMP. Maybe he's a little bit stressed out. Got a little setup of a general store type thing. A woman's style shop. Blacksmith shop over there. And assorted other displays. They've got stuff out in the back here as well. Come in here. Ooh, smells like grandma's closet in here. Mothballs. That old radio, old stuff, lots of stuff, if you're into old things, there's all sorts of things here, even the kitchen sink. Let's have a look inside the caboose. Let's check it out. Yeah, it might have been fun being in a caboose back in the day. Traveling across Canada or the States. Might have made a heck of a racket too, being back here, I don't know. Never ridden in a caboose. You have to ask this guy what it's like, I guess. Hey, what's it like being in a caboose? You don't say. Yeah, because you don't say. Old car ads. Love and pizza. Sometimes that's all you really need in life. Check that place out. Looks like something out of the Wild West. The Hart Hotel. From 1928, according to that little sign on there. Looks like it was a hotel and a pub. Yep, it was a pub. We're leaving Poos Coupe and heading toward Dawson Creek now. We're in Dawson Creek. Mile zero of the Alaska Highway. This is the start of the Alaska Highway. Not exactly the wild and woolly frontier town you might think of. It's just pretty much a big modern city, or a mid-size, you know, not a huge city. But, uh, yeah, it's got all your stuff. Huh? Look at that, a Walmart even. Hmm. Yeah, not too wild. All your food chains, McDonald's, and W. Got your Canadian tire there. I'm here at the official start of the Alaska Highway, heading up toward the Yukon and maybe Northwest Territories and maybe up the Dempster Highway even to the Arctic Ocean. Stick around, we'll see where I end up. I just met Natasha here and she has sailed around the world and now she's going on a motorcycle around the world. Tell us a little bit about you and your life here, Natasha. Well, uh, nice to see you guys. Uh, I am Polish from Ustka City and I have sailed solo around the world on a 10 meter yacht before and now I go on a motorbike and I ask people to donate for the charities I work with. So the more people find out about my trip, the bigger chance we're going to help others so that's cool. And what, how do they find your charities? I'm going to show you my business card. You have a website here. Okay. And then on the other side, you can see there is two charities. One is for uh, kids who are being abused, and another charity is for 
families who has disabled children. Just a trip to the trees. The plants are waving, smiling. Here's a little history on the region. Although a lot of people worry about bears, and there are a lot of signs warning about bears, bears are not the worry here so far. I haven't even seen a bear yet. They're probably up in the high altitude areas. And the real worry are the mosquitoes and the mice. I've had mice get inside my car almost, or in part of the car, almost every night now for a week, and even had one crawling over me while I was sleeping last night. We're leaving Dawson Creek here and we are on the Alaska Highway. Adventure awaits. The Alaska Highway, also called the Alcan, is legendary. It was constructed during World War II to connect Alaska with the lower 48 states and service military outposts in Alaska during the war. 10,000 soldiers built the highway, all 1,500 miles of it, in about eight months, which was an epic feat. It was 18 kilometers to Fort St. John, but before that there was the Peace River crossing, and just beyond, the small town of Taylor. My first impression of Taylor was that it was an industrial-looking place, likely an outpost of the burgeoning oil and gas industry. I stopped in town and found that I was in Mackenzie country. Mackenzie was one of Canada's most famous early explorers, who traveled thousands of miles by canoe. Row, I say. Row. I'm going to stop in the visitor center here in Taylor, and that's Amanda, and she's here. She can help you if you got any questions. So tell us, Amanda, about the, this cabin. So our cabin is that we have a visitor center in is original to the Taylor original Taylor Flats, which is just on the south side of the Peace River here at Taylor, and it was made in 1932, and by the Anderson family, and it was bought in by the Ostros gravel pit and donated to us so we can have the visitor center. And we actually have a mammoth tusk that was found in Ostro's gravel pit. And the real one is in Tumblr Ridge Museum, but we get to keep the replica. So if anybody wants to come see it, they're more than welcome to come see it and touch it. And I think they figured it was about a 35 year old male that it came off of. And the bad story was, good bad story, was that this mammoth tusk almost was destroyed. Because the very next day it was to go into the rock crusher. So they saved it so that we could all enjoy it and science could see what all its secrets. And you can come in and get a little brochure about Sasquatch stories. And just so you know, do not feed the Sasquatch. A fed Sasquatch is a dead Sasquatch. Before you go, be careful around the Fort St. John Peace area for the H2S signs if you happen to be boondocking. This is what an H2S sign looks like. And it means that it's hydrogen sulfide and it can kill you if it gets in strong enough uh, concentrations. So just be careful. If you ever see a sign like that, don't boondock there. And uh, stay away and stay safe. And that's because of the oil and gas? Yes, it's the oil and gas and it's a, a product that's in the, the million, in the drilling and it's in the earth's core. So it's just a natural product that gets made and we all go through safety programs to make sure we're safe when we, walk, when we work around it. Not me necessarily in the uh, tourism industry, but I have another job where I go out in the oil and gas patch. So I'm just warning you all. Be safe and come back alive, because we want to see you another day. Coming into Fort St. John, it had an industrial feel to it, no doubt due to the exploitative industries so prevalent here. There seemed to be a slight waft of a sulfur, rotten egg type smell as I was driving in. Time for a lake break. Been driving a while, so it feels good to just walk a little bit. Check out this little monument here. This is Charlie Lake, and it's the site of tragedy and heroism. On May 14, 1942, 17 soldiers got on board a pontoon boat to deliver equipment and supplies from the south end of the lake to the north end. The water became increasingly choppy. A plug popped out of the fuel line of the motor, and the craft was losing gas. 
When they turned to head to the west shore, the boat was swamped by waves and started sinking and was under in only two minutes. A local homesteader who'd been keeping an eye on the pontoon's progress took his rowboat out to rescue the men, many of whom couldn't swim. He managed to save five soldiers in three trips, risking his own life in the process. It was really beginning to sink in how big the distances are here. 1,342 kilometers to Whitehorse, or 842 miles. After a fire, you have fireweed growing. I found the vast fields to be quite pretty. Fireweed is edible, and I've added it to many meals. This is one of the things Amanda at the visitor center mentioned to me. Watch out for the sour gas. This water that I got from the convenience store with a nice restroom has a funky, sulfury, rotten egg sort of smell to it. And it was in that oil drilling region, so I'm wondering if that could be why. The highway was quite busy, and I noticed that the oil and gas trucks, and likely some log trucks, their tires coated in mud, would carry rocks onto the road, and then the oncoming trucks would kick the rocks toward my car, sometimes hitting the windshield. Going down a dirt road, looking for a place to park for the night, and this is one slick and slippery road from all the rain. Gotta keep it on the road going back up for sure. And the road ends at a gas line. Yeah, got a little mud going on with those tires there. Great. Heading back out, not so much because I'm worried about poisonous gas, but because I want to find a quieter place farther from the highway noise. I tried another road, but it just ended up at a pipeline as well, and there's that sign that Amanda warned me about. Looks like all these little roads lead to pipelines, However, this one looks like it may no longer be in use. So, I'm kind of tired of looking around. I think I'll just park it here and it's flat. It'll do, I guess. And it's raining again. With a few exceptions, it's been pretty much a constant string of people, houses lining the highways. I'm referring to the areas outside of the national parks. And that's where the constant string of people in houses has been. And then I was thinking once I got up this far north that the country would be super wild and remote. However, what I've found is that it's really just a, a lot of gas and oil pipelines and service roads and all that sort of thing. And there are you know, people all along the way. So I'm looking forward to maybe getting up to the Yukon. Possibly that area is still remote, wild, and unspoiled. I guess we'll find out. I could gripe about the rain, but I really can't complain because I got the best weather through the best parts. All through the Rockies where the best scenery was, I had magnificent weather, 85 degrees every day pretty much, and the views were spectacular. They weren't obscured by clouds. So, you know, you're just paying the price right now, and that's okay because I'm in an area which is less scenic. Gonna mix these two to make a simple heat and eat dinner tonight. Gonna cook inside the vehicle on the Coleman double burner stove here because everything out there is wet, wet, wet. And I don't feel like tromping through the bush and so getting all soaked myself looking for any kind of dry firewood. It's just easier to do this and quicker. Fire it up. Get the pot on and there we go. Coconut squash doll and long grain and wild rice. Quick, simple dinner. There's the morning sun behind the clouds. It rained a lot last night and created a little pond. Moose country. I'm waiting for a sign that has a silhouette of a Sasquatch on it. According to this brochure, here at Pink Mountain would be the place to find a Sasquatch. On the way to Pink Mountain here, I uh, saw several signs, not just the small signs that Amanda pointed out, but rather large signs about three feet high that said, no entry, no parking poisonous gas. This is an updated version of the original Alaska Highway mile markers and you'll find a few of them along the way. They like their energy exploitation here because that means jobs and money. Wherever you look here it's all energy. The cars, the trucks. This is my buddy Sasquatch. Also known as Bigfoot. 
This is Sasquatch Crossing and it's got a restaurant, hotel, and a gift shop. Here's a quick look at the restaurant. You can fuel up here as well. I spoke with a pipeline worker at the Sasquatch Inn and he said the pay is good, but the life is harsh. You have to go to your next job and you never know where that is or how long it's going to last. And he said he was pretty tired of it because he never got to stay home much. And he had to come back and forth traveling from Edmonton all the way out to here. He said jobs could last 30 or 40 days or however long they lasted. It was very unpredictable. Just north of the Sasquatch Inn is another mile marker 148 and right here it explains a little bit about Suicide Hill. Back in the day the road climbed to avoid a muskeg bug and that hill was dangerous. It claimed several vehicles and a driver before the highway was rerouted many years later. I think that's probably a muskeg bog out there. Now it's just a lonely highway threading through the Canadian bush. I wouldn't have expected to see this. Wild horses out here? This is the spot in the road known as Bucking Horse. Not a lot here. Just enough to get you by. There's a restaurant and sometimes gas. And there's a motel. If you're low on gas, you'd be screwed today. There's no fuel here. The next gas station is 176 kilometers away. Looks like more of the energy complexes here. I love the open road. The Prophet River First Nations community. Let's go have a look. It's a community that looks like it's carved right out of the Canadian bush. Prophet River School. A large wooden beaver here at the First Nations community. Hey dude, have you been to a dentist lately? Just across the highway from what I just showed you are these old looking log cabins. Imagine living in one of these while there's five feet of snow on the ground in the winter. That could certainly give you a case of cabin fever. A little story about the Alaska Highway Realignment. 80 kilometers to Fort Nelson. Past the charred wreckage of the toothpick forest. Looking smoky again. As I was flying by, this lake caught my eye. Thought we should check it out. It doesn't have any roads or any signs. It's just a natural lake with nobody here but me, along with mosquitoes. It's really peaceful here when no traffic's going by. This is kind of the wild thing I was looking for. I was told a couple of days ago that there are more than 400 fires burning in BC, and they could burn, even with the rain, all the way until the first snows in possibly late October. Coming into Fort Nelson, a lot of energy, oil fields, gas pipeline stuff here. I think this is the Musqua River. This is the Fort Nelson Museum. If you want to come out and have a look, stop in the museum here in Fort Nelson and have a look at the car shed. Lots and lots of cars. I thought I would be more likely to encounter that in the city. Hey man, what are you doing in my neighborhood? So that's how much gas costs in Fort Nelson. I decided that this would be a good place to boondock here by the Musqua River. It makes me think of an SNL sketch with Chris Farley where he's yelling at them saying, you're gonna end up in a van down by the river. Well, you know, it doesn't really look like that bad of a thing. Right? Yes, a van down by the river, or in my case, an SUV. It's looking pretty nice right now. There's a fire ban in all of BC, and there are apparently 465 or so fires in the province. That's a lot of fires, and you can see the smoke around here. So, being that that's the case, it's just heat and eat dinners again, and this is what I've got. One of those eerie smoke suns. Good misty morning to ya. Getting close to the Yukon. The North Country can seem foreboding and mysterious.
let's have a quick look around Fort Nelson. Got your A&W, which is pretty common in most Canadian towns. Here, lodging, plenty of lodging here, places to eat. You can stay here, get thing, gas up, get some food. It's about 3,000 people here. Boston Pizza. Long way from Boston. Fort Nelson is the last best place to get gas and find lodging until Watson Lake, Yukon, over 300 miles away. A legendary Fort Nelson Hotel. That's what it says anyway. You got a nice rec center here. You gotta have stuff like this if you're gonna live with winters like this. Up in the far north, cold and snowy, long winters. And just so you know, this is the British Columbian flag. We're about to leave Fort Nelson here and we'll come along and head over this way to Muncho Lake and then Liard Hot Springs and onward to the Yukon. As I was leaving Fort Nelson, I saw the sign that said 973 kilometers to Whitehorse, which is a little over 600 miles. Gassed up completely full tank in Nelson there. So we're good to go for a long way. In Fort Nelson, I met a Canadian woman who was probably in her 70s, who was out with her two dogs. I noticed she was wearing a Trump hat, not MAGA, just Trump. At first, she started telling me about her life. Then she began telling me that Joe and Hunter Biden are actually dead, and there are three main Hollywood actors playing them while wearing lifelike skin masks. She said Clint Eastwood plays Joe Biden, and when the president stumbled and fell, that was actually Eastwood playing the part, and that the actors have voice modulators implanted into their teeth. She went on to say that all the fires in the province were intentionally set by the Canadian government in order to convince the public that climate change is real. I'm not a political channel, I'm just telling you what she told me. Does she know something we don't? Or is she from an alternate universe? Let me know what you think of this in the comments. I was told that the reason the original Alaska Highway was so winding was that so in the case of an aerial attack they couldn't wipe out an entire convoy if they strafed it. But it's likely that it's so curvy because in their haste to complete the highway they simply went around obstacles that might have slowed them down like bogs and marshes and heavily wooded areas, in favor of smoother, drier ground. Most of the Alaska Highway has been widened and straightened, so it's not quite as interesting as it once was. I drove a stretch of the old highway about 20 years ago, and with the trees closer together and the winding road, it just had a much more intimate feel. From the days of old on the Alaska Highway. Gas is 2.39 a liter here. Hey, but no sniveling, eh? This looks like it might actually be part of the original Alaska Highway. It's kind of windy. Uh, with the trees closer to the highway, it has more of an intimate feel to it. Like you're going through a forest. It's just a trip. changed caution signs now it's bighorn sheep just a hundred yards away from that sign we've got caribou warnings at the base of these big mountains is what's left of the summit lake settlement let's have a quick peek in this place an old ugly couch mattress some purple walls and doors Another mattress. And what do you have? A pink bathtub. There you go. Look in the other side real fast here. An old TV and pull out couch. Beautiful brown color there. Uh huh. Some more purple seam going on in here. Yeah, and this was obviously the bedroom here with the mattresses and uh, cracked up old lamp there. What kind of bathroom do we have in here? Oh, we've got that stunning pink bathtub again and the same kind of layout here. Let's take a quick peek inside this. That's quite an old fridge. Looks to be from about the 1950s, I would imagine. Beautiful couch. And it's uh, Kind of busted up in here, I would say. To Alaska. Yes, many people are going to Alaska. Yeah, 
avocado green toilet. Yeah, it's just a messy old room there. And uh, I saw something else here. Let's see, where, what did I see? Ah, that was it. The lime green sink. I think this place just done dried up. Let's have a look in here. If you need a pair of boots, there's some waiting for you here. And I found this newspaper here, and I thought it would be older. It's only 2014. Just a load of rotting stuff in this room. Looks like a fire might have burned through here. Cafe and motel entrance open. Nah, I don't think so. The place is fully open, just not for business. Since it's open, let's have a look. Yeah, a lot of wood here on the walls and broken glass on the floor. Right, look at that. Fridge for the food. This was the kitchen back here. Still got an old microwave back there. Sink over here. And this is where they probably had a pantry back in there. In this room, a whole lot of mail, a lot of letters and such. And looks like some brochures, pamphlets, possibly some magazines, just a lot of stuff. Addressed to the Summit Lodge. Back in, does that say 1988? This one's got 1987 on it. Those look like some very old pickles. I think those pickles were fully fermented, but I'll pass. And what roadside joint would be complete without a trailer in the back? There was a gas station here as well. Fill her up with shattered dreams. And just a few hundred meters up the road is Summit Lake, where there is a campground if you decide you want to stay here and hang out for a while. It's just right off the road with a mountain backdrop. Hey, look, the sign was right. Bighorn sheep. More sheep coming up. Hi, little baby. Now that's a pretty scene. I guess you could say that's gorgeous. Going through the gorge. Too bad it's so smoky. I bet this would be a fantastic sight. A beautiful view. I mean, it's still nice. It's just smoky. Hey buddy, better watch out. Rocky Mountain Lodge back there. Apparently you can get gas. Side wreckage and ruins. This one looks like it was a shark fin Cadillac. Have a look at the back here. That's what I'm thinking it was. Who knows what color it was, but they got it from Ascot Motors. Or they just liked Ascot Motors. I was wondering what this was, and that's the telltale sign that this is indeed another gas station. Gun belly up. Moss growing on the counters now. Fill her up with belly up. Looks like maybe this was an old motel or something. Let's have a quick look inside here. Hey, you know what? If you were bicycling and the weather got really bad, you could actually hunker down in here and use this as a shelter until the storm passed. It looks suitable. I think you'd stay dry at least. I know a thing or two about that because I actually cycled from Lakeview, Oregon all the way to Alaska and the Yukon in the late 90s. It might be a little rustic, but it would do in a pinch. If it got rainy and really cold. It looks like somebody may actually still live in this one. Probably a hunter's cabin or something like that. Little bed back here, even. I wonder if that thing still runs. Looks like a bit of a tight squeeze coming up here with this bridge, but I guess it's not too bad. 
nice river down there. I've got a question for you. What do you think of my campsite tonight? One way you know you're getting really remote is that when you try and find a station on either the AM or the FM radio, there's absolutely nothing. That's so cold, it numbs your hand. The long and winding Alaska Highway. Insert your face here. The settlement of Toad River was created during World War II when the military built housing for the soldiers. This is the Toad River School, and I was told that it was moved from Muncho Lake and has a class of 7, K through 12, and that the largest graduating class ever was three people. Originally, it was Toad River, T-O-W-E-D, because they towed uh, army vehicles across the river, and it was later changed to Toad River, like ribbit, ribbit kind of toad. I was talking to a co-owner, Daryl, who told me that they had found all sorts of World War II things, such as jeeps and grenades, when they were digging around. And they called the RCMP and they came and got the box of grenades out of here. You can get gas, food, and lodging, and you can have a nice little view here of the lake, which is right beside everything. You might see moose, elk, or swans. This is the Toad River, where the American Army towed their vehicles across. Leaving Toad River behind, taking the 97 north. If you make it to the Toad River campground, it appears that the camping's free here. That's a big mountain ahead of us. This is an example of a folded mountain. Speaking in geological terms, you can see the rock folds. Getting into some very mountainous country here. This is the northern Canada of dreams and imagination. Muncho Lake, gas food lodging, and looks like maybe they had boat tours at one time. Look at those cool old gas pumps. Looks like they've got a price on there. $2.40 a liter. So they might actually be functioning still. That looks like something out of that movie, Cars. You can mail a letter here at the post. Hit the road, Jack. If you like fresh baked bread, this might be your place. They have a fun collection of funny signs here. There you go, fisherman. Just off the highway, you can park your plane, apparently. Check that out, up on the ledges. Those are stone sheep, a subspecies of doll sheep. This bug is a spruce beetle, apparently. This is Muncho Lake. Sorry it's so smoky, but not much I can do about that. I just met Michael here, and he's going to tell us about something amazing he's doing. Hey guys, so uh, my name is Michael Jordan. I'm with March of the Warrior, 27,000 km. And uh, what I'm doing here is I'm rooking across Canada, all three oceans, starting at the Arctic Ocean. Uh, April 17th I took off from. And I'll make my way down to Vancouver Island Ocean, then over to the Atlantic where Terry Fox started, and then I'll finish down south in Windsor, Ontario. The idea behind it, guys, is to show people that you can overcome mental health illness or mental health problems by, by physical and exhausting hard work, laborious endurance, or actually just physical hard work, guys. It helps clear the mind. So that's the main goal, talking about mental health and breaking that stigma. Awesome, and that's true. I mean, you get out, out in a place like this, you do a lot of physical activity, Absolutely. it clears your mind, makes you feel better about yourself. That's right. There's a whole lot of benefits to doing these type of things. Absolutely, yeah, and you know, it's a simple, inexpensive exercise to do as well, guys, and if you're overweight, it's a lot easier than running on your knees. You can just get out, get a rucksack going, and you start losing those pounds and get out into nature. I, like, I can't even stress it to you guys enough how important it is. We're meant to be on the land. Get out there. Yeah. We're meant to move. We're meant to move. Motion's lotion. That's it. <laughs> and where are you from originally? I'm from uh, Kingsville, Ontario, actually. 
So uh, the most southern town you can go, and I actually started in the most northern. And uh, so I've been overseas for the last four years serving. Just got back and decided it's time to uh, do some good in my country as well and talk about mental health. So you say by the end of this you'll have about, what, 27,000? Minimum 27,000 kilometers, depending on how it goes. I could push into the States because I'll finish down south at the uh, Windsor-Detroit border. So if all goes well, you never know, I may push into the States even further. But we'll see one thing at a time. We'll finish the first goal, 27,000, and then uh, who knows what will happen after that. All right, 27,000, you'll take it from there. Yeah, take it from there. Awesome, man. Great to meet you. Thank you, man. I appreciate the opportunity. Good luck, Thanks, man. man. So, Michael, you've had some serious encounters with bears, is that right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, I've had many encounters, uh, especially on the Dempster. Dempster Road was closed the entire time I was on it from washouts, and I had just gotten by after the uh, ice crossings. So, um, I had some close encounters with grizzlies on that road. One was a standoff with one. Um, you know, that's a long story in itself, but an amazing story. But the most close, the, the closest encounter was a black bear down over by Morley Lake, where uh, he got me inside my tent at about four o'clock in the morning, destroyed my brand new Koyu tent. And um, yeah, we ended up having to unload a whole canister of bear spray on him. And uh, that was a four o'clock in the morning fight with a grizzly bear in my underwear. <laughs> <laughs> did, did he swat you? Yeah, he swatted me. He got me on the face uh, while I was in my sleeping bag. So I had to make a quick exit outside of my other tent, roll out. And um, yeah, luckily I had all my stuff ready with me. No food in the tent, you know, but uh, some, some bears are just very inquisitive. So yeah, it was, uh, it was quite the time. Wow. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> the skies may not be clear. But the water of Muncho Lake is. Good advice, they do have float planes coming in here. Now we're getting into some serious wildlife. You do not want to have a collision with a bison. This is a different style of bridge. Got a miniature Golden Gate or something. Look at that big river out there. Wow. This is what it looks like in the Canadian bush. It's dense, can be dark, green, very woody, can have lots of mosquitoes, and it can be very, very quiet. And on this road, it looks like a big blob of bear poo. I can't tell you if that's black bear or grizzly. However, you may have heard the joke that. Black bear poo consists of nuts, seeds, berries, and grasses, while grizzly bear poo consists of bells, whistles, and smells like pepper spray. Wow, the temperature's jumped up to 81. These fungus look almost fluorescent. If you want to get a closer look to Smith River Falls, you can go way down these steps. They're really steep. You know how they like to say everything's bigger in Texas? Well, I don't think so, y'all. I've seen bigger mountains, bigger waterfalls, bigger lakes, bigger rivers, all right here in British Columbia. And I think British Columbia is, maybe approximates the size of Texas even. I'm not sure, I'll have to check that. Time to go back up the steps. Bear alert, bear alert. There is a bear at the side of the road. Black bear. Uh, yeah, thanks guys for uh, blocking my view there. Really appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, gonna do it again. Okay, yeah, scare the bear and block my view. Thank you. This is the little spot in the road known as Coal River. You can get gas, cafe, and a gift shop. Donna's Coke Cafe. They've got diesel fuel and bison burgers. Just in case you didn't know which way you're going. Gas, food, lodging. That reminds me of that bus. That guy into the wild, Chris McCandless, who was in the Alaskan bush and he died. Just north of Coal River, they call this Whirlpool Canyon. And I think down there, 
is why they refer to it as that. Bison alert, bison alert, we have bison. Look at that thing. Wow. Look at that face. That's what's known as a wood buffalo up here. Woodland buffalo. He's coming right at me. Right toward the car. I'm staying inside the car. Yeah, he looks uh, pretty intimidating. That is one big boy. One very large beast. Looking right into the eye of the bison. Some interesting shaped mushrooms around this place. I parked for the night just outside of a tiny place called Fireside and I just found these. Look like they may be something even from World War II era. I'll show you Fireside in just a second. Still got the old basketball hoop up there. Let's go in and have a quick look. Yeah, there's a most Canadian of items right there. Hockey stick. There's still an old poster on the wall here. I wonder how old that thing is. I'm wondering if this could be one of the original World War II houses for the highway workers. It's possible. Some of the stuff in here does look pretty old. In all likelihood, this was a shed or a shop. This was probably somebody's house. We'll have a look in here and see what's in here, if anything. Some old newspapers, but not super old, only from 2003. And this looks like this was the bedroom back here. Some more newspapers. I uh, just have to smash a mosquito or two. And huh, what is this? Oh, there you go. Why Ben dumped JLo. Yeah, and uh, oh boy. There you go, Britney Spears, always up to something. Fireside is perched just above this river. And you see some nice sandy beaches down there. Car graveyard back in here. Lots of old cars, vans, pickup trucks, four-wheel drives. An old trailer here. More stuff back there. The old station of the North Woods. What kind of plant is that with those red flowers? This is what's left of the little community of Fireside, British Columbia. Mile 543 Alaska Highway. It says it's sold on there. I guess somebody's got some plans for it. Looks like somebody may live in a bus back here or in a trailer or something. Check it out, there's Bigfoot up on top. Sasquatch right there. That looks like me in the morning. Old fire truck. It once was an RV park and a camping area. Another old fire truck, appropriate for Fireside. BC's second largest fire ever occurred here. Look at that old T-Bird. What is that, a 64? I can't say that I've ever seen somebody make an attraction out of discarded generators before. But here it is, in all its glory. But somebody's got a lot of work ahead of them. I wish them well, whoever's deciding to renovate this place. Here in northern BC, they say it like it is. A flashing sign, drive with caution, buffalo next to 100 Ks. Those are the Cranberry Rapids down there. Another roadside buffalo. I feel like I'm finally getting out in the truly wild country here in northern BC, not far from the Yukon border, maybe an hour away. Wilderness areas in the States are, they're all right, but I think there's something lacking in them. I like wilderness areas, don't get me wrong. And I think that is the true characteristic of wildness. There are a lot of people that go there, and you will see lots of people on the trails and such. And here, I think you can go and walk out Maybe way out to that mountain out there. And you could just park it, camp it, for maybe a week and see absolutely nobody. 
You could be out there for maybe a month and not see anyone. Maybe even several months. Maybe until hunting season comes, or maybe you wouldn't see anybody at all. And unless somebody came out looking for you in a search and rescue thinking you're dead. That's real wildness. And that's real wilderness. We've reached the Yukon border, so that's going to do it for Northern British Columbia. Join me in my next video as we explore the Yukon, one of the wildest places left on the continent. Don't forget to give me a like on the video, share, and subscribe. Until next time, this is The Rock Hopper. I'll see ya.